Hi everyone, Brent McGee Quilts here with another Sew With Me video. I'm hand quilting today without a hoop. I'm working on the water on this coral reef quilt. Today I'd like to talk about stuffed animals, <laughs> as it were, and a one gigantic blue whale that I saw. Now, I didn't see this blue whale underwater. I saw it in New York City at the Natural History Museum. But it took several times before I saw it. I used to live in the Seattle area. And while I was long distance dating my now husband, on a trip I took out here to New York, I wanted to see the blue whale at the Metropolitan, not the Metropolitan Museum, but at the Natural History Museum. I've always been obsessed, I mean, as you, if you, anyone who follows this channel knows, I'm obsessed with the ocean and all things ocean related and whales, of course, represent, I don't know, maybe kind of a zenith of, of an ocean creature. And the blue whale is the biggest of them all. And unless you're on a boat out at sea, you're not going to see one in an aquarium. I mean, it's the largest creature the earth has ever known. Um, literally bigger than anything that's ever existed. And it's still around today, the blue whale. But they've got one hanging from the ceiling at the Natural History Museum in Central Park. So I wanted to go. So we go to this Natural History Museum. And I said, well, let's save, you know, the museum has different sections. And one of the sections is the an, a, basically an ocean exhibit with lots of different ocean dioramas and then hanging from the ceiling, this gigantic life-size blue whale. So I said, let's go see other parts of the museum and we'll save the best for last. So if you've never been to this museum, it's, it's big and sprawling and tons of different um, exhibits from, you know, rocks, minerals, various different minerals that you, you know, all displayed to dinosaur bones, all displayed um, a trip through the history of hominids like human beings, Neanderthals, uh, etc. There's planetaria, you know, there's a whole bunch of things, but I would say the, the most, what it's famous for are these gigantic realistic animal dioramas which are composed of taxidermied animals or what appear to be taxidermied animals many of them are not real actual animals they're reproductions made of various materials i would i might even say most of them are like there's this huge herd of elephants in one of the halls that's they're all stampeding and it's it's quite a sight to see. I mean, you're probably never going to see a herd of stampeding elephants in your life unless you live there in Africa um, or Asia, I guess. So to be able to see something like that frozen in time and as, a, as a, almost like a still picture that you can walk around there in the museum is amazing. But those aren't real animal carcasses that have been taxidermied. Those are models that have been built. Um, there are some stuffed animals and it there's something about it. There's this uncanny quality to seeing these dioramas of all these stuffed animals in the Natural History Muse Museum. First of all, you, you feel a little sad because you, you're wondering which ones are real and which ones aren't. And you're thinking, God, for the ones that are actually a killed stuffed animal you know they're, these are endangered species now and who knows how long ago this um cadaver was taxidermied and put on display and the displays are you know they they're they're painted and they add you know plastic plants to make them appear to be in their natural habitat so you kind of get an idea of what this creature is 
And what they are is they're like little rooms. So you walk along a hallway and it's like you're looking into a zoo exhibit, but the animals are not alive. They're posed. Uh, many of them are posed in a hunting position or in a leaping position. You know, they're given life in their stillness. The other thing you don't know that you might not think of is the, these exhibits are covered in dust. It's quite a dusty museum when you when you look past the actual thing that they're showing you, you see that but maybe they could do a little more upkeep in this museum, you know, a cobweb on an antler, for instance. Um, so you have this kind of uncanny moment where you're feeling a little guilty about a dead animal, um, but also you're gawking at its physique, or if you're anything like me, it's making your imagination run wild, and you're actually seeing, oh, there's an artist is at play here. Taxidermy is one of these things, like quilting in a way, where it's considered a craft, but can it be raised to the level of art? I think we've all been, we all know a hunter or a, or a fisher who has, you know, maybe a head mounted on their wall or a fish that they've had taxidermied, uh, posed like it's swimming in a brook upon their wall. And do we think of that as art? I don't know. Not, I don't, for the most part, me, no, I see it. I see it as kind of cool. It does sort of make me feel a little certain way. Like, uh, why is a life being displayed like a trophy? Because it's not being displayed for scientific purposes like it is, or educational purposes like it is at the museum. Uh, like, for instance, is it art or is it craft? My husband and I, we like to go down to uh, Chelsea in Manhattan. And they have art galleries that you can go and visit. And different artists are in there at different times. So if you go through different times of year, you see different artists. It's kind of a cool thing. Well, in one of the smaller galleries, there's this very interesting artist. I wish I had her information right now to tell you, but I don't. And she does taxidermy, artful taxidermy, where she actually procures zebras and foxes and, you know, not just things you would go hunt in a North American forest, but, you know, exotic animals, for lack of a better word. And she combines them with human features. Obviously, the human features are not real humans. They've been, you know, sculpted out of various materials and combined with these animal pelts to create these almost mythic satyrs or uh, centaurs or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, fox, fox bodies combined with a human face to create something uncanny and beautiful but creepy. We went into her little gallery and I was like, first really taken in by them I was like wow this is you know I love all things natural so I was like wow this is really something else Bjorn couldn't handle it my husband he had to walk out of there because he he just saw dead animals being you know defaced essentially is how he saw it he had to get out of there well the the artist was there and it, so after Bjorn left, it was just me and the artist. And I was looking at this, I guess we'll call it a sculpture, of three life-size zebras in a very, or maybe it was two, I don't remember, but in a very dynamic pose. And then they had human faces or torsos, something like that. And... It, it's very wild. Anyway, so she comes over to me and she goes, are you in the market market for a zebra? 
And I said, well, I didn't think so. <laughs> I said, I don't think so. I could not never afford something like this. And she asked, oh, are you an artist as well? I said, I am. I actually am also an animal artist. I, I make quilts. And she said, oh, quilts are very now. That's what's happening now. Anyway, I did ask, and I'm sure she gets asked this a lot, but I couldn't help. I said, oh, how do you procure these pelts? And she said, well, they come from zoos where an animal has died. And, you know, since she was kind of an, uh, a well-known artist, I guess, in some circles doing this, she has a little bit of clout. And so she was able to procure these pelts from animals that had died in zoos. So we chatted a bit and next thing you know, I'm leaving. She gives me her card. And after that conversation, she was perfectly nice. And I, I don't know, I wasn't, I wasn't offended, but I was like, ooh, this is, this is a complicated gray area with stuffed animals. So, you know, I tell Bjorn about it. Of course, he thought it was just a complete disgrace that this woman is trying to sell, this artist uh, is trying to sell the carcasses of animals. Plus, you know, neither one of us is a big fan of zoos and aquariums in general because I know they have lofty intentions, but it's, you know, those kinds of conditions are not conducive to the mental health or even the physical health of those animals. No matter how large or intricate the enclosure they put them in is, you know, they pace. So he thought, so his take was, oh great, so they come from a zoo, they spend their whole lives being tortured in a cage in a small setting, and then they die only to become, you know, this chimera art piece. I thought this was a good point, Bjorn, very good point. Um, so back to the museum. It begs the question when you see all these stuffed animals, some of which are real, most of which aren't actual pelts. What would be worse? To be killed once, you know, hunted in your natural habitat, killed, stuffed, and put on display, or meant to live your entire life behind bars, essentially, for screaming children um, and annoyed parents to gawk at, banging on the glass. Uh, being given a bouncy ball as enrichment. I think of Shamu and the killer whales and that, that's gotten so much traction where now SeaWorld isn't even allowed to breed the whales anymore. And basically what's going to happen at SeaWorld is once their population of orcas, you know, killer whales has died in captivity, they're no longer going to do orca shows because they're not allowed to go out and get them from the wild anymore. And they can't breed them. Or they vowed that they wouldn't breed them. And so... That's that. Also, they don't really do those. They do do a kind of show, but it's not like what they used to do where the trainers are jumping in the water and they're going through hoops. It's more like a display of, quote unquote, natural behaviors. They've really changed up that Shamu show. When I was a kid, my dad took me to SeaWorld and of course I loved it. And at that time, we weren't thinking so much, you know, society as a whole wasn't thinking about whether or not these animals were happy in that little, you know, when the ocean is your normal, when the entire ocean is your normal home, even a large pool is a kind of torture. Pacing back and forth, swimming in circles. And we know that it drove those animals crazy even some to kill their trainers. Um, so what would be worse? Being killed from your 
environment and stuffed into a museum or forced to live your life in a tiny cage. And it made me think about my own life, especially during COVID, where we were confined to a small space when we had the whole world to ourselves previously. And for me at that time, I was really struggling with, like a lot of people, uh, depression and really substance abuse. For me, it was alcohol and marijuana. So it was like my life became... It was like, to to tell the real story, I was taking very long baths each day because it was relaxing, but it was like the only grip on my sanity I could get. It was like returning to this watery womb was paramount. So my life was going from the bed directly to the bath, to the bong, to Billy for the dog, our dog, for a walk, to Bjorn, my husband, to the bottle for a drink, to the bong, to the bed, to the bathtub, to the bong, to the bottle. A kind of circle like a whale in a tank. Driving me crazy, driving us all crazy. I'm certainly not unique. This was going on with all of us. And for a moment there, we all got to feel what Shamu feels like. You're living a life uh, that you could live, but it will drive you crazy if you do it for too long. I have since uh, stopped um, all alcohol and all marijuana. been sober for over a year now of all of that my life has been nothing but better I no longer feel like uh, I'm not taking baths anymore either I no longer feel like I'm you know Shamu trapped in a in a tiny tank but you know what I don't know I I certainly don't want to be dead and stuffed in a museum I would definitely choose to be stuck alone and stuck in this house with my family my dogs and my husband um, over being dead and stuffed in a museum so it's a complicated answer can I answer for an antelope or for a lion or for a tiger that's been killed and stuffed and put in a museum I cannot and I can't answer for the the tiger in the zoo either but it does make you think so it was so we're in the museum seeing all these stuffed exhibits and instead of just enjoying them for what they you know we're supposed to enjoy them for I'm having this existential dread well it's time to go see the ocean area where the big blue whale is and of course it's not a real blue whale obviously it's it's a big stuffed whale but the area was closed so I was not able to see this whale that I had been wanting to see for years. And the reason it was closed, the, air, the, the ocean area was closed that day, was because they were having a fundraiser. And, you know, they were doing a private event in there, you know, some kind of dinner. You could even hear the jazz band warming up in the other room. The sounds of trumpets and saxophones and a drummer getting his kit together. Sound check. And I thought, man, who who wants to have dinner amongst a bunch of stuffed animals? And I just ranted to Bjorn. I was like, I am so angry that I'm not allowed, that the public in this publicly funded museum isn't allowed to go because some rich people are going to have a fundraiser for some disease where that is surely not to be cured because of this fundraiser. And most of the money is going to go to the actual running of the charity rather than the thing they're actually being charitable toward. You know, it was a rant about the how rich people don't only <laughs> rich people need a party, a fancy party in order to give it to care. 
you know, in order to give their money, they don't want to do it in in taxes or something like that. They need they need to be lavished. They need to have they need to be surrounded by the largest creature on earth as their dinner companion in order to cough up a few thousand dollars. So I was thoroughly mad that I didn't get to see the whale. And it wasn't until a few years later that we actually went back down to the museum so I could see this whale finally. And this time we got to the museum, I said, we're going to go straight there. To the, instead of waiting to do it to the last, we're just going to go straight to that exhibit. And it was open that day. Now, the history of me and whales, like I said, Shamu, so many of us of my generation, I'm 40, 41 now, and, you know, we grew up with SeaWorld being a, a normal thing. But as I grew older, I don't know, I've had this obsession with whales. I even wanted to write a, like a, a little mini musical where I sort of reinterpret Moby Dick and the tale of uh, Jonah and the whale with myself as the, as the pursuer of the whale, as the, as the person who has been consumed, Jonah gets consumed by the whale. And while he's in there, he transforms into someone else. I am not a biblical person by any means, but, but as a story, I found it interesting that he goes into the belly of a whale only to come out of there a different person, a believer. A man on a mission is what happens to Jonah. He's quite depressed. I mean, it literally says in the story of Jonah and the whale that he's depressed and he, he goes into the, and he, he has to leave. He's like a fugitive, I, I believe. And, and he's, he sleeps in the, in the belly of the boat until God sends a storm to wake Jonah up. Because basically Jonah is avoiding all of his problems. He's running away from his problems. And God says, well, you're not going to run away from your problems. You're going to face them. And I'm going to send this storm and I'm going to throw you into the ocean and a big fish, a whale is going to eat you and you're going to live in the belly of the whale for three days, contemplate your actions. And when you finally get spit up, picked up and put back on land, you're going to go to do the thing that you know you need to do. And I guess for me at that time, I was still drinking and smoking a lot and you know, I was working in a bar too. I was working as a piano player in a bar. And so my life was just soaked and depressing. And like Jonah, I was asleep at the wheel. And I longed for a whale to consume me, to force me to change. I wasn't someone who hit rock bottom or anything like that, like you hear in stories, but I was definitely on a path and I longed for a whale to come and consume me. And so I thought, I don't know, maybe seeing this whale at the museum would give me some taste of that or the it would inspire some kind of awe. I don't know. So we get there, and it's busy. That museum is always busy. And there it is, this 100-foot blue whale hanging from the ceiling. It's posed in such a way where it's almost as though it's just taken a breath, and it's now diving. Oh, here comes my own little blue whale, my little doggies. My big doggies, rather. Anyway, this whale is posed like it's diving down into the water, back into the inky depths. And you can look up underneath it, but you can also, there's like a, a balcony level around it where you can be at eye level with this whale as well. And so we were, we did both. And it was like, 
not a thing. It was, <laughs> it was not this awe-inspiring moment. Instead of seeing the whale as this big thing that could consume me, that could swallow me whole, instead I paid less attention to the whale and more attention to all the people surrounding it. The screaming kids, the tired parents, who, whose faces seem to be saying, if you've seen one stuffed animal, you've seen them all. And this whale looked more like prey than predator in that moment with all the people surrounding it. And it just was a reminder that the whale is not out there. Captain Ahab and Moby Dick made the mistake of thinking that if he, if he found the white whale, his Moby Dick out in the sea, and killed it in revenge for taking his leg, that all of his mental anguish would be solved, that finally that act of revenge would change him, would ease his pain. And that's not what happened. So, no, I continued to drink and smoke and generally live a kind of, I don't know, sort of numb, mildly miserable life for years until COVID hit and put me in a belly of the whale in this house. And then I started quilting and decided I'm not going to go play show tunes in a bar anymore, um, drinking shots of tequila all night. I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give up the the bong, and I'm gonna devote myself to making these works of art in devotion to the seas, in devotion to the whale, and let the work change me rather than some miraculous single incident. So here I am sharing that journey with you here. Um, I do plan to make some kind of whale quilt. Uh, I dream of a life-size whale, maybe not a blue whale, but uh, I'm working something out. So these quilts you're seeing me make now are just the beginning of a larger journey that I plan to go on and show to anyone who will look. So there you have it. That's the story of me seeing a blue whale, just another stuffed animal. <laughs>